in theater and art scene, Mary Thornton. Mary was an instrument, instrumental member of the Magical Puppet Theater Company, Famous People Players, located in my riding. The entire company consists of people with developmental and physical challenges. Their work pays homage to famous people. Liberace loved them so much he brought them on tour. Since then, they have created almost 30 productions and attracted supporters such as Paul Newman and municipal, musician Phil Collins. Mary created the signature style of the company, designing the brilliantly colored props, costumes, and life-size characters brought to life by the performers, earning her praise from critics around the world. Mary made a difference in the lives of many. Yesterday, we celebrated Bell Let's Talk. Today, I would like to honor someone who achieved so much, gave so much every day to provide an opportunity for success to many people who are marginalized in our society. Mary continued to work with the company until a few months ago when she died on December 11th at age 103. Mary, thank you. Wow. The Honourable Member for West Nova. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, the tallest wooden church in North America is in Church Point, Digby County, standing at 185 feet high. Eglise Saint Marie boasts 41 stained glass windows, and the architectural detail uh, is stunning. I highly recommend this landmark to anyone visiting the Clare region. While the structure of the church remains sound, the 115-year-old giant needs maintenance and repairs and comes with a price tag of $3 million. La Société Edifice Saint Marie de la Pointe, men in collect de fonds pour they're doing a fundraising event until September 2021. They, if they don't obtain their objective, they're going to have to demolish it. It is an important symbol of our heritage. As a proud Canadian, I'm concerned for that important historical site, and we have to make all the necessary efforts, efforts to preserve it, and I I'm going to follow up with this file. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Chateau Guy Lacolle. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Few people have the honour of receiving such a aw distinguished award as the Governor General's Literary Award. There's a woman from Chateau Gay, Anne Marie Voisard, who has won this award for the essay category for her book, Le droit du plus fort, nos dommages, leurs intérêts. This book was published by Edition Eco Société. At, with an interview, she, we said that she showed great courage by criticizing this sector. Ms. Voissard had the courage to shake up the legal representations, which we have assumed to uh, have been normal, and she has been rewarded for this. On behalf of Chateau Gay Lacolle, I would like to thank her for her contributions to a more just society. The Honorable Member for salabis sur -Rois. Mr. Speaker, it's with great admiration that I'd like to offer my sincere congratulations to Mr. Marc-André Lachapelle, a young man of 17 years old, a resident of saint zotique for his brave act in saving Ms. Yvette Gingras. Mr. Chapelle went to work on January 5th, and he saw Ms. Gingras in distress by the side of the road. The young man quickly ran to the woman and performed CPR on her until the paramedics arrived. Mr. Lachapelle, your brightness of spirit, your maturity, and your sense of duty saved the life of Ms. Jangra. And, of course, I'm sure you'll make a wonderful ambulance driver, and I hope you will be working in salaberry sur roi I'd like to join the Jangra family in offering you my warmest thank you, and I'd like to wish a quick recovery to Ms. Jangra. For Brampton East. Mr. Speaker, I rise in the House today to recognize the incredible work of an organization with roots in Brampton, the Sikh Sewa Society, which provides free meals for the less fortunate in our community. Weekly, they serve over 400 meals and have been doing so each and every Sunday for the past four years. The mission of the Sikh Sewa Society is to have an open platform for citizens of all ages, races, cultures, and faiths with a simple motivation of selfless service for the whole of humanity. The Sikh Sewa Society aligns their mandate with the core teachings of Sikhism, including working hard, giving back, and serving our communities. And their actions are inspiration to many Canadians. I'd like to extend kudos to the organization's volunteers and founders, including Peel Regional Police Officer Manjeet Singh Basran, Gurjeet Singh, and Parmjeet Singh Ajla. 
Their profound dedication to the betterment of our community does not go unnoticed and is much appreciated. In this new parliament, may all of us in this house not lose sight of the importance of our role in serving those who allowed us to serve them. Thank you. Honourable Member for Simcoe Gray. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to stand in the House today to celebrate an important community event in my riding, the Sunnydale Winterama. The event, which kicks off tonight in the town of New Lowell, is celebrating its 45th anniversary this year. Winterama is organized by a small, dedicated group of volunteers from the area who work hard to put on an exceptional weekend of activities. There's something for everyone, from kids' games and free fireworks show to community dinners and a charitable silent auction. Winterama is also a major showcase for small business and at the craft market, and an excellent opportunity for our many talented local musicians who are playing at events throughout this weekend. My family and I look forward to seeing many familiar faces at the spaghetti dinner tomorrow night. Thank you to the many hardworking volunteers and community members who have helped make this event possible this year and the past 45 great years. The Honourable Member for West Vancouver Sunshine Coast Sea to Sky Country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The downing of Ukrainian Airlines Flight 752 is a national tragedy that struck very close to home. Pillars of the North Shore community were lost, and families are going through a time of unimaginable grief. In the aftermath of this heartbreaking tragedy, fellow Canadians have stepped up to support their Iranian Canadian neighbours. Nowhere was this more evident than the memorial organized by Nazarene Filsouf of the Iranian Canadian Foundation. Hundreds gathered to, to remember the 57 Canadians, 29 permanent residents that were on this flight. The North Shore Jewish community hosted this important event at the Har El Synagogue. It's fitting that these two communities came together to support each other and that we recognize both this tragedy and the Holocaust this week. While this event might have been surprising just about anywhere else in the world, it's another poignant example of, of national unity and a reason we should all be proud to be Canadian. When one community suffers, it's felt across our country, and we support you so you're not alone. Thank you. Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the Correctional Service of Canada celebrated the Citizens' Advisory Committee Awareness Week. This citizen-led movement ensures that the public is involved in corrections, increasing openness and transparency. I would like to thank the over 400 Canadians who volunteered with the Citizens' Advisory Committees across the country. I applaud their dedication in the institutions and parole offices, and I am proud of the work they do in my own riding and, of course, those across the entire country. Please join me in thanking all the Citizens' Advisory Committee members for their tireless efforts and contribution to public sa safety for all Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, on January 27th, just three days ago, the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada released the review panel report on CN's proposed truck rail hub in Milton. The panel determined that this project is likely to have a significant and adverse environmental impact on air quality and human health in Halton region. It's now in front of the Federal Cabinet for review and a decision. The review panel recognized this project will have a negative environmental impact. The region of Halton has concluded this project will negatively impact the communities of Burlington, Oakville, Milton and Halton Hills. And most importantly, the people of Halton have voiced their strong opposition to this project. I'm calling on the Liberal government and Liberal members from Halton region to do the right thing, protect the environment and listen to the people of Halton region. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Coquitlam, for Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, Canadians across the country are mourning the victims of flight PS752. In Coquitlam, poor Coquitlam, this tragedy hit at the heart of our community with the loss of all three members of the Hamidi family. Ardalan Abnadin Hamidi, Nilufar Rizagi, and their son Kamyar Abnadin Hamadi. Over the past few years, I came to know the Hamidi family as engaged community supporters. In particular, Cam spent many hours volunteering with me this past fall. He was following in the footsteps of his parents, developing the same commitment to community activism. I feel their loss deeply and offer my sincerest condolences to his friends, to their friends and family. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for North Okanagan, Nashuswa. Canada's fisheries have declined significantly in recent years, despite Liberal promises to reverse those trends. Threats to Pacific salmon stocks grew exponentially last year with the discovery of the Big Bar Slide on the Fraser River. Efforts to capture salmon and move them around the blockage benefited a few, benefited a few fish, but few fish survived the, the ordeal. After six months of Liberal promises, work has finally begun to remove the blockage and hopefully avert the, ex the extinction of some of these salmon stocks. I thank the engineers and the workers currently working to fix Big Bar, but I also join many Canadians in asking why it took half a year for this government to get to work on this urgent job. All along, the government promised to resource this work, but their delays cost the essential loss of resource time. This is only one of the challenges facing our fisheries, and we will be holding this government to account on the actions they take or do not take on this file. Well, member for Lambton, Kent Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, something that is often overlooked is the impact of the carbon tax on farms and agriculture. Who's going to feed Canadians when this government continues to raise taxes and tax farmers out of business? I'm disappointed that yet again, the Liberals are overlooking the struggles of millions of Canadians. Vague platitudes will not put food on the table. The carbon tax is failing farmers, and it does not reduce emissions, especially in our rural ridings. All pain, no grain, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the carbon tax takes every, makes everything more expensive. I had a farmer who sent me a bill and in one month had to pay over $7,000 in carbon tax to dry his grain. Profit margins are already so low for so many farmers, and the Liberals want to tax them more, squeeze everything out of them. As the member for Lambton Kent Middlesex, I promise to stand up for our farmers and fight Trudeau's uh, job killing carbon tax. I just want to remind I want to remind the honourable members when referring to someone else in the chamber not to refer to them by their name, but refer to them by their title or their writing. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. For many Canadians, having a home people can afford that fit their needs is becoming harder and harder. For some, it's impossible. There is a problem all across the country. Yesterday, Ottawa declared a housing and homelessness emergency. Women's shelters are having to turn away victims of domestic violence. We see people sleeping in tents out of desperation. In Vancouver East, we've had a tent city at Oppenheimer Park for more than a year. There is no recognition of the overwhelming homeless population in urban, rural, and northern Indigenous communities. For the Liberals, when something is urgent for their corporate friends, they will go to any lengths to make it happen. But for Canadians who need a place to live, they have to wait. Enough is enough. We need to see a substantive increase in funding for the national housing strategy and a dedicated program led by Indigenous peoples for Indigenous peoples. The Honourable Member for Belloy Chambly. Mr. Speaker, Super Bowl Sunday is this week. And like many Quebecers, I will be rooting for Mr. Duvenet Tarnif. Like all Quebecers, I will be looking at the actions of an exceptional player who is from the riding of Ballet Chambly, Le Mr. Laurent Duvernet Tarnif. He plays for the Kansas City Chiefs, and he'll be in charge of protecting his team's quarterback, and he's also quite an exceptional player. So the number 76 could be become the first Quebecer to win one of the uh, to wear one of these famous champion rings. He will also be the first professional football player to be a, a medical professional. Mr. Duvernier Tardif was a brilliant student who showed that through perseverance, young Quebecers are capable to carve out extraordinary destinies. And I would like to encourage Mr. Duvernay-Tardy, 
through his foundation that bears his name. This foundation offers scholarships. So go, Chiefs, go. Okay, the Honourable Member for Barrie Innisville. <laughs> We're seeing just how out of touch with ordinary Canadians this Liberal government is giving $50 million to MasterCard. If we were to create a Liberal credit card commercial, it might sound like this. Canada's deficit, $27 billion. Canada's debt, $800 billion. New fridges for Loblaws, $12 million. An airport in Cape Britain for millionaires, $18 million. MasterCard's quarterly revenues, $4.4 billion. MasterCard's size by market value in the United States, bigger than Walmart. Canada's Prime Minister giving MasterCard $50 million tax dollars, priceless. There are some things money can't buy, but for everything else, there's the Liberals. How can the Prime Minister justify this reckless borrowing using the Canadian taxpayer credit card to give MasterCard a single dime of our tax dollar? The Honourable Member for Gatineau. Mr. Speaker. Canada and music lost a virtuoso, legend, and hero to millions of air drummers the world over. <laughs> Neil Peart, drummer and lyricist for Rush, succumbed to glioblastoma after a three and a half year fight and tragically only four and a half years after Rush's final concert. Rush était un rare groupe qui fait Rush was a major group that was very successful in Quebec and across Canada. They had famous albums and they gave some of the most legendary concerts at the Forum of Montreal. Fame. Neil Peart was generally recognized as the best rock drummer in the world and the driving force behind one of the most successful touring bands of all time. I offer our condolences to his family and all his fans in between the bright lights and the far unlit unknown. Thank you for your words and your music. Questions, question oral, the Honourable uh, Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, last Wednesday in a hotel room in Quebec City, 22-year-old Marilyn Levesque was brutally murdered. The 51-year-old accused who'd murdered his wife 15 years prior was on day parole and had been encouraged by his parole officer to hire Marilyn for sex. Will these Liberals, at a minimum, condemn unreservedly what the parole board and this parole officer did and commit to correcting this so it never happens again? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as, as I've said previously, we extend our deepest condolences to the family. We understand and we share the concerns of Canadians about this case. Um, public safety must always be our first consideration in all parole decisions, and, and the parole board makes these decisions independently. But in response to the concerns that are being raised, Mr. Speaker, uh, I have asked the Chair of, of the Parole Board and the Commissioner of Correction Services to initiate a full investigation and a review to determine the circumstances under which that have led to this tragic case and to ensure that all established protocols were in fact followed. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, that's an incredibly weak answer from a so-called feminist government. Why couldn't that minister have stood up and said unreservedly they will make sure changes happen so this doesn't happen again? Here, here. Protocol, Mr. Speaker, this should never have happened. Now, I have another question for this Liberal government. We know that MasterCard, a company with over $16 billion in revenue last year, is getting $50 million from the Liberals. Shame. Everyone knows that MasterCard does not need this money. So will the minister do the right thing and reverse this terrible decision to give MasterCard $50 million? Oh, the Honourable Minister for Economic Development. Sorry. The Government of Canada has invested in a major new cybersecurity 
center, which will make Canada world leading when it comes to countering cybercrime, ensuring cybersecurity, as well as developing new technologies. This new investment made by the government will create hundreds of jobs across the country, in particular in British Columbia. Thank you. Well, opposition House Leader. MasterCard made $16 billion last year. I think they can afford to develop their own cybersecurity. <laughs> they are making this $16 billion. Canadians who can't afford to pay their credit card bills at the end of the month. MasterCard didn't need the $50 million. Actually, no credit card company needs $50 million from this Canadian uh, Liberal government. How can the Liberals keep defending giving millions of dollars to billion-dollar companies? The Honourable Minister for Economic Development. Mr. Speaker, on this side of this House, we believe in job creation and we believe that we need to make sure that we make the right investment to ensure this job creation. Maybe, maybe somebody can answer my question, how long before everyone's quiet? Okay, very good. We'll let the Honourable Minister continue, please. Not only do we believe in job creation, but the facts are clear. We were able to create a million new jobs over the past four years. And that is why we are supporting the development of the tech sector in British Columbia, in Western Canada. We believe that we need to do more to create good jobs all across the country and that the growth that we're seeing is shared all across the different regions. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lerable. Mr. General, to investigate the Liberals' $186 billion investing in the Canada plan. Last year, the Auditor General said clearly that the Liberals were not providing the appropriate funds for the office to do its works. It, this has asked the Auditor General to do an important job, Mr. Speaker. Can the Prime Minister assure this House that the Auditor General will have all the resources necessary? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, I'm delighted to answer this very important question. Investing in middle class Canadians, investing in further economic growth, investing in our infrastructure across Canada has been a key plow, part of our plan since 2015. We look forward to having good conversations with all people in this government, including the Auditor General, to make sure that our investments are as effective as possible. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. They don't even know what middle class is, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Never in the history of Canada has a government spent as much to accomplish so little. In fact, the Prime Minister is the biggest spender and the most careless with taxpayers' money we've ever seen. The Auditor General of Canada stated last year that he lacked sufficient funding to do his job. Yesterday, the House gave him a mandate to investigate the Liberals' $186 billion infrastructure plan. Will the Prime Minister make a commitment today to give the Auditor General all of the necessary funding to carry out this important mandate? The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague to give me an opportunity to answer this question in French. One million jobs have been created since 2015. Many Canadians lifted out of poverty. Economic growth, the strongest in developed countries. A solid fiscal framework based on all people who are, have studied this issue. Mr. Speaker, we have not only done a great deal, and we, we look forward to continuing to work for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tech Frontier will put an end to the Paris Agreement. 260,000 barrels per day. Four million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Questions on this? It's uh, insupportable down there, intolerable down there at that end. And the uh, Prime Minister lacked his normal levels of respect towards my colleagues, and he said that he worked to and made decisions based on science, but she didn't. 
ministre de l'Environnement, je crois. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. C'est qui qui répond? L'Honourable ministre de l'Environnement. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Monsieur le Président, le gouvernement tient... Mr. Speaker, the government will take into account uh, many factors when making a decision on this factor, our commitments uh, to be carbon neutral by 2050 in order and to advance reconciliation, to create uh, good quality jobs for the middle class, and to promote economic growth. This is a major project that our government is uh, examining carefully as the in environmental requirements stipulate uh, a decision will be made by the end of February. The Honourable Member for uh, for Belle Chambly. And I lost some time on the last question because of the noise at that end, Mr. Speaker. This, pro uh, this project will also need an oil, uh, a pipeline, in order to proceed. And it's a 40-year project, uh, and it goes 20 years beyond the limit when the government wants to achieve its carbon neutral status. So is the government afraid of saying no to Jason Kenney? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. This is a major project that our government will examine very carefully. As the Environmental Assessment Act requires, a decision will be made by the end of February. As with all other projects, the Cabinet can approve it upon conditions, reject it or extend the time frame. Our government uh, is currently examining the matter and currently a decision has not yet been made. Mr. Speaker, there's a difference between saying the right things and doing the right things. The Liberals like to use pretty words. They named a ministry, but they can't define what the middle class is. They're putting forward a tax cut that actually most benefits the wealthiest 10%. Well, New Democrats have a solution. If will the Liberals, are they prepared to put in place a targeting of that tax cut to benefit those who need it most and then use the money that's left over to develop a national dental care program to help Canadians who can't afford to take care of their teeth? Here, here. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister of Finance. I'd like to start by saying how much I appreciate this question. We want to every day remind Canadians that the very first thing that this new government did is put in place a tax cut for 20 million Of course, this follows on the heel of the last Liberal government that also put in place a tax cut wow. for millions wow. of people. Canadians to know is that we are going to continue to work on their behalf. We're going to deal with the real challenges of affordability now and in the future. Excellent. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, people, people don't need words. They need action. The Liberals have appointed a minister, but they can't even define what the middle class is. They propose tax changes that will give the most benefits to the wealthiest people. We have solutions. We have proposals. Are the Liberals prepared to target these tax changes so that they can put in place a dental plan to help people who don't have access to dental services? The Honourable Minister of Finance, I'm very happy to have a question regarding our approach in this area. The first thing that we did was uh, cut taxes for 20 million Canadians, and that's very important. This is exactly what we started uh, in the last mandate with the tax cuts for Canadians. Our approach is to ensure that uh, to improve the situation for Canadians, and we will continue to do so for t today and for the future. Nose Hill. Mr. Speaker, yesterday a government-appointed panel enthusiastically recommended that the government should control what news coverage Canadians should be allowed to see. Under this Liberal plan, the Liberals would be able to force all news sites to prominently link all of their coverage to Liberal government-approved websites. This would have an instant chill effect on free speech and diversity of thought in the Canadian media ecosystem. 
Does the government think that Canadians are too dumb to think for themselves? The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Speaker, there seems to be some confusion on the other side of the House between members of the Conservative Party. On the one hand, mere hours after the report was published, a member for Durham declared that he would throw it in the garbage. On the, au contrairement au député de Belle contrary, on the contrary, the member for Bellechasse, the member for Bellechasse, Etchemin Levy, was very open to cooperating with you, and we're happy to hear that. So, Mr. Uh, Speaker, this will help uh, to create uh, a new ecosystem to protect Canadian content. Calgary knows Hill. Well, that's the exact type of fake news that the Liberals want these new sites to implement. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Between this proposal yesterday, their chosen one print media bailout fund, and even the minister's mandate letter goes as far as to suggest that he should implement the thought police, a ministry of thought police <laughs> for Twitter and Facebook. Like, this is not free speech, and free speech should be something we should be standing up for. When is he going to abandon his proposed ministry of truth? <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Monsieur le Président, nous remercions. Mr. Speaker, we thank the Yale panel for their ambitious work that they have devoted the past 18 months to and for the report they delivered yesterday. We will look carefully at the 87 recommendations made in the report on telecommunications, broadcasting, and online content, Mr. Speaker. Our government is determined to, to support this sector in Canada. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Quebec government uh, unveiled its proposal for the third link in Quebec City which will link Quebec City to Lévis via tunnel, and it will be using public transit. Conservatives al have always been in favor of uh, transportation corridors and the third link. However, we know that during the election campaign, the uh, Liberals uh, showed great contempt for this third link. Will the Liberal government, and this is a yes or no answer, uh, tell us whether or not it, it agrees uh, with this third link? The Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank the member opposite for the question. We have uh, not received the project, so we can't make a decision yet. Hello. The honourable member. Well, if the minister hasn't uh, received uh, a proposal, the people of Quebec have, and they're even more in favour of it because it's based on public transit. It's at the heart of the decision. So, Mr. Speaker, there are people here, and particularly the Minister of Heritage, who have always uh, been staunch proponents of the third link. Can the government tell us today whether or not it's in favor of this third link project? The Honorable Minister of Infrastructure. The member opposite could perhaps uh, ask the Quebec government to give us a project. I'll tell you what we've done in Quebec. We are investing in the Blue Line, the tramway, the Champlain Bridge, affordable housing, and I could go on and on. We are here for Quebec to build our country, to create jobs, to cut to greenhouse gas emissions. For Brandon Suris. Last fall's harvest was incredibly challenging due to rain and snow, and now farmers are stuck paying the Liberal carbon tax to dry their grain. The Minister of Agriculture is stalling and failing to support our farmers. Even the Green Party wants to have grain drying, uh, carbon tax exempt from, uh, from grain drying in last fall's harvest, Mr. Speaker. So when will the Prime Minister keep his word and stop punishing farmers who are being forced to pay the carbon tax for the grain they were drying, and when will he reimburse them for the taxes that they've already collected? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that 2019 has been a very, very difficult year for our farmers because of the weather, because of the trade disruption as well. And this is why we are working so hard with the stakeholders, I mean with the representatives of the various sectors, with my provincial counterparts. We are working on finding 
real practical solutions for them. They already have some programs to some safety nets through our business, man, uh, business risk management program that they can rely on, but we are working to improve them. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Foothills. Speaker, for Canadian farmers, this has been a harvest from hell, and the Liberals are only making it worse. They don't even understand it. Canadian farmers have had to dry their grain, heat their barns, and they are being crushed by a Liberal carbon tax. Jeff Nielsen from Green Growers Canada says, and I quote, these costs are adding up and we cannot continue to pay the price for this inaction. The Agriculture Minister has already admitted she is not even keeping data on the impact of the carbon tax on farming. Incredible. When will the Liberals exempt Canadian farmers from the carbon tax, give them back the money they've already taken, and end this ridiculous field of schemes? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that 2019 has been a very, very difficult year for our farmers because of trade disruptions and because of weather. And we are working closely with their representatives. I'm working closely with my provincial counterparts also because we want to find practical solutions to what they are going through. This is important to take the good decision based on data, and I'm working with them to uh, work around all of this. Mr. Speaker, I'm really committed to supporting them. The Honourable Member for saint hyacinthe bagot Mr. Speaker, free trade agreements are having a huge impact on Quebec. Before ratifying the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the International Trade Committee heard from no fewer than 400 experts. For the new NAFTA, the number of experts that have appeared is zero, Mr. Speaker. The committee hasn't heard a single witness. Between 400 and zero, there's a huge difference. It's hardly surprising that uh, the government sacrificed ag farmers and aluminum in this hastily signed agreement. Will the government acknowledge that it was in such a hurry that it cut corners and that Quebec is going to be paying for that? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I disagree 100% with my colleague opposite. The real reality is that the new NAFTA agreement has significant benefits for Quebec. As Premier Legault, among others, said, the new NAFTA agreement preserves millions of dollars of exports to the United States, including cultural ones. And it's important not only for Quebec. We have also maintained supply management at a time when the U.S. was calling for its demise. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Mr. Speaker, in the new NAFTA agreement, the government chose to protect steel over aluminum. We'll repeat this again. 70 percent of automobile. The Honourable Member for Lac-Saint-Jean. Well, we're going to talk about mathematics then. Mr. Speaker, there is zero protection, zero protection of Quebec aluminum under this agreement. Abandoning aluminum means that auto manufacturers are going to be taking advantage of dumping at the expense of Quebec. And I'll explain this to you again. What this means is that Mexico can buy auto parts and call them a North American product. I've been repeating this for two months now, and the government doesn't seem to understand it. How can the government, how can the government have a, signed an agreement that encourages Chinese dumping at the expense of Quebec aluminum? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my colleague on one point, the fact that Canadian aluminum is green aluminum that Canadians must be proud of our aluminum industry and that we must all work together for the aluminum industry. We did that here. Our government did so by working in close cooperation with the industry. The example as is that we had all tariffs on aluminum lifted. End. Mr. Speaker, the government has confirmed that they now have a plane which at some point is expected to bring Canadians in China back home. However, there is very little information being shared about the plan to get these individuals home. The minister has said that they will be quarantined, but her officials confirmed at yesterday's health committee meeting that they still don't know what that means. Can the minister tell Canadians what her quarantine plan is? Minister of Health. 
Speaker, and I'd like to correct the record. I have said that all options are on the table to make sure that we're protecting the health and safety of Canadians here in Canada and those that are abroad. I can confirm that the 196 Canadians have registered for help to get back to Canada. I'm working closely with my partners at Global Affairs and the Public Health Agency, and we will be putting together a comprehensive plan that ensures the health and safety of all Canadians, regardless of where they're residing. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthur Basca. Mr. Speaker, at the request of the Conservative Party, the Standing Committee on Health held an, urgent, an emergency meeting last night to, to get an update on steps taken to protect Canadians from the coronavirus. Unfortunately, many of the questions asked by cons the Conservatives went unanswered. Mr. Speaker, no one wants to be alarmist, but Canadians want answers. Can the Prime Minister tell us how the return to the country by Canadians will unfold whether, and whether or not they will be put into a quarantine. The Honourable Minister. Our Chinese counterparts to repatriate Canadians. I will say information that we are hearing preliminarily from China is that patients who are ill will not be able to travel back to Canada, which raises important questions about how we can best support them while they are still in the region of Hubei. As we speak, as I said, officials are working closely together to ensure the safe transfer of Canadians and support for Canadians who remain in a heavily quarantine, quarantined area that is making movement and other uh, services very difficult to acquire. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Foreign Affairs said that the government is working out the logistics on how and when to bring home the Canadians in China affected by the coronavirus quarantine. What criteria will be used to determine which individuals will board the evacuating flight? Will the evacuation include permanent residents of Canada travelling abroad? unaccompanied Canadian minors, spouses, who else? Will the minister immediately outline the specifics of the plan to bring Canadians home? The Honourable Health Minister. As I said, Mr. Speaker, it is very important that we work with our partners, both here in Canada, but also internationally, to make sure that we protect the health and safety of Canadians, regardless of where they're residing. I provided information about what we know to date in terms of the Chinese government's perspective on ill passengers traveling. I will tell you right now that the process we put into place will have of utmost importance the safety of Canadians that are here in Canada, but also the health and safety of the Canadians who are desperately seeking to be reunited with their families and community. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, in 2018, this House unanimously approved my motion to address marine plastic pollution. We all agreed. Plastic pollution hurts our economy, our, uh, the marine environment, and all Canadians. Countries all over the world are banning single-use plastics. France has banned plastic cutlery, plastic plates. Rwanda banned plastic bags. This isn't hard. But today, the Minister said we need to wait another 60 days for more findings. The government needs to stop talking and start acting. When will they move to zero waste plastic and when will they stop shipping our plastics to developing nations? What are they waiting for? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. A colleague for his question and also his work on this issue. Uh, something that we promised last year, Prime Minister promised last year, is that we would ban single-use plastics, harmful single-use plastics, by 2021. Mr. Speaker, we're very proud that today we put forward the science assessment, the draft science assessment, Mr. Speaker. We want to do this with Canadians, so we're asking Canadians, we're inviting them to give us their feedback and be a part of the process. 60 days from now, we'll start the process of moving forward with that ban, Mr. Speaker. We know it's important, not just for us, but for future generations of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, the World Health Organization is meeting to determine if the coronavirus is an international public health emergency. And we learned yesterday that Canada intends to send a plane to evacuate Canadians trapped in affected regions in China. But what the government hasn't answered yet is when this plane will land and what measures will be taken to quarantine passengers who may be infected. With an incubation of 14 days, this virus can easily spread without proper planning. Will the Health Minister reveal what her full plans are on when and how the evacuation of Canadians can safely be carried out? The Honourable Health Minister. 
it's really important that we remember, remember that there is a difference between quarantine and isolation. People need to be in isolation if they're sick to prevent the spread of illness because the spread of illness, of course, is transmitted through droplets. But quarantine is there when there are people that are asymptomatic. And right now, what we know about the virus is that it cannot be transmitted while people are asymptomatic. The plan that we put together, we will reveal to Canadians as soon as it is complete. And as I've committed before, I will be fully transparent with this House and with Canadians as I, as I have been to, the, to date. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax West. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement recently visited a very important initiative for Nova Scotia, for my constituents, and for our Navy and Coast Guard. She saw Canada's burgeoning shipbuilding industry up close. The economic impact, which can be felt across the region, She's includes fair. enhanced skills training and spin-off jobs. Will the minister inform the House of the importance of the middle class jobs being generated and the exceptional craftsmanship of the new vessels produced at the Irving shipyard in Halifax? Minister for Public Services. from Halifax West for the question. I saw firsthand many Canadians hard at work building Canada's next generation of vessels. This work is contributing to over $1 billion annually to Canada's GDP and creating or maintaining over 11,000 jobs per year. I can assure Canadians that they can take pride in these new vessels and in the workers who are equipping the Navy and the Coast Guard with the ships they need to serve all yes. Canadians. Honourable Member for Charles Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, yesterday during the debate on Bill C-3, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice said that police forces should not be monitoring themselves. So when the Prime Minister says that the parole board will be investigating its own members in the case of Nylan Levesque's murder, it's not surprising that Canadians find that unacceptable. An internal investigation isn't good enough. When will the government authorize an external investigation? For public safety. I thank the member for his question. And, and, and let me assure him and all Canadians that I and our government take very seriously this heinous crime committed against an innocent Canadian. And we are, will do all that is necessary to ensure, first of all, justice for her, but also to ensure this terrible crime is not committed again. Mr. Speaker, we have asked for a com very comprehensive review and investigation. First of all, the criminal investigation will be conducted independently by the Quebec Police Service, and we've asked the, the Chair of the Parole Board and the Commissioner of Corrections to conduct an extensive review to look at all of the circumstances so that we may have the facts and respond appropriately. Well, if he really wants to give justice to the victim's family, I have an idea. Order in Council number 2018-0802 was passed in order to appoint the two parole board members who decided to release the murderer. The order states that a member can be fired with valid grounds. It's absolutely unconscionable that a murderer found guilty of killing his wife of killing his partner should be released and given permission to receive sexual services from women. Now, Ilan Levesque didn't deserve her tragic fate. When will the minister take action and fire those two parole board members? For public safety. I certainly agree with the member that Madame Levesque did not deserve her tragic fate, and we are going to take steps to make sure that this, these circumstances are not repeated. It is precisely why, Mr. Speaker, we've asked the Parole Board and Correction Services Canada to, con to conduct a full investigation and a review. If individuals have engaged in mal mal malfeasance or misconduct, they'll be held to account. But we are also going to look at our policies, our procedures, and the training of, of, of our Parole Board members so that we can ensure that the Canadian safety is always protected. The Honourable Member for Medicine Hat, Cardson Warner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the electronic surveillance report tabled recently in this House showed that for the first time there were zero judicial authorizations issued to keep track of returning terrorists. We know from numbers provided by CSIS that there are approximately 60 ISIS terrorists in this country. Can the Minister explain to Canadians why none of these terrorists appear to have been monitored in the last year. Good question. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. 
And Mr. Speaker, let me be very clear that those who leave to support Canada to support terrorism are utterly reprehensible, and our goal is always for these individuals to arrest, charge, prosecute, and convict them. We have now charged, in fact, five of these extremist tra tra travelers and convicted four of them for traveling abroad to engage in criminal activity. Despite their, their, their concern now, during their term as government, no one was charged or convicted by any of the Conservatives. Mr. Speaker, we, we condemn the acts of these individuals, and we will act to ensure the safety of all Canadians. The Honourable P uh, Member for Peace River, Westlock. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my question is a simple and straightforward question for the Minister of Public Safety. When will he bring Canada into full alignment with the Palermo Protocol? Yes or no? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, to be very clear, we, we are absolutely committed to fulfilling our responsibilities to our agencies and departments in protecting the health and safety of all Canadians, and we will ensure adherence to all of the legal requirements to do so. Honorable Deputy. The Honourable Member for Bhopal, Lee Mwalu. Mr. Speaker, the 3,900 civilian members of the RCMP are anxious about having their pay transferred to the Phoenix pay system, or should I say the Phoenix nightmare, which created problems for 74 percent of public servants just last year. Worse, these workers are now being threatened. The government has told them, if you don't want your pay to be managed by Phoenix, no problem, you have until tomorrow to submit your retirement papers. Will the government, one, stop threatening people and push back the February 1st deadline, and two, stop forcing people to board the sinking ship that is the Phoenix pay system? The Honourable Minister for Public Services. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, public servants in Canada deserve to be paid correctly and on time for their important work. We have made significant progress in stabilizing the pay system. Our government recognizes that pay problems continue to be a source of stress for employees and their families. In the meanwhile, in the meantime, we will continue to give employees uh, flexible repayment options in order to minimize any consequences uh, they may be facing. The Honourable Member for Beauport Limoilou. Mr. Speaker, in her mandate letter, the minister was asked to replace Phoenix with a new system because Phoenix is beyond repair. What a perfect example, Mr. Speaker, of federal bureaucracy. On the one hand, they try to kill Phoenix as fast as possible, and on the other hand, they're pushing even more people into the system. What genius thought of that? Will the government spare these 3,900 civilian RCMP members the nightmare of Phoenix? The Honourable Minister. Our public servants deserve to be paid correctly and on time. The Conservatives botched the Phoenix pay system, causing real suffering for uh, thousands of public servants who are working very hard. With the help of public servants, uh, unions, uh, suppliers, and others, we are working to find a modern and reliable uh, system. Public servants deserve no less. For Lethbridge. The previous government took concrete action, and that was to say they banned the practice of prisoners within federal penitentiaries from being able to access sexually explicit material on their televisions. I'd like the minister to confirm that this ban is still in place. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. I, I, I can advise the member opposite that I have been, not been advised that there has been any change in the established protocols of Correction Services Canada with regards to this matter. The Honourable Member for Markham Unionville. M Mr. Speaker, mayors from across the GTA have called on the Liberals to keep convicted gang members behind bars longer. Stop the revolving doors for releasing known gang members out on bail and stop gun smuggling. These are all measures that have been rejected by the Liberals in favour of a soft on crime approach. That approach will cost billions of dollars and do nothing to keep us safe. Will the Minister of Public Safety listen to GTA mayors? Good question. Yeah, yeah. 
Honorable Minister of Public Safety. I thank the member opposite for the question, and I'm delighted to tell him that he's simply wrong. Our government is absolutely committed to the safety of our communities. We have made a commitment, Mr. Speaker, to strengthen gun control, for example. We are going to redouble our efforts at the border to prevent these crime guns from being smuggled into our country by increasing the presence of CBSA officers, adding technology, and supporting the police in their investigations. We're also preventing theft by strengthening storage requirements and preventing criminal diversion with new rules, new offenses, and stricter penalties. We, unlike the previous government, have invested in policing to, to support guns and gangs investigations, and we will invest in communities to help our kids. The Honourable Member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, despite being a veteran infantry officer fully trained on a number of prohibited and restricted firearms, I recently completed both the Canadian Firearms and Restricted Firearms Safety Courses. These courses are integral to knowing about the firearm safety and ensuring Canadians store and use firearms. These courses would also be incredibly valuable to any of us in the House of Commons looking to craft firearms legislation. Can the Minister of Public Safety please confirm he has completed these courses? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, through you, I'd like to offer my congratulations to the member opposite for a successful completion of his course. I'm also pleased to advise him that I actually carried a firearm for 39 years, and, and I have taken extensive training on it. Excuse me. Order. I want to remind the honourable members that if they have a comment or a question, to direct it through the chair, not directly across the floor. L'honorable député de Honourable member for Bourassa. Mr. Speaker. The Minister of International Development recently returned from a trip to the Congo and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Could she update this House uh, as to the, the goals of that trip and tell us about how Canada is working with its partners to build a more peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable world? Thank you. Honourable Minister, I thank my colleague for the question. During my trip, I had the opportunity to see the work that Canada is supporting there, as well as the needs that still exist in the region. I saw how 170 million people were impacted by devastating floods in the region uh, that started last September. And in the DRC, I announced urgent humanitarian aid for survivors of sexual violence and to help fight the second largest Ebola epidemic in history. I'd like to express our appreciation for the extraordinary work of all of our partners in the region. For Kildonan in the St. Paul. 2019, Winnipeg had the highest rates of violent crime in Canada. Robberies are up 45%. We had 44 murders, double from the year prior. Almost all of this related to the meth crisis, not from legal gun ownership. 27-year veteran of Winnipeg Police, Constable Rob Carver, said a handgun seizure, quote, won't change the threat level in IOTA. And Winnipeg, our police chiefs across Canada agree. Mr. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals admit their policy is completely out of step with police on the front lines and does nothing to keep Winnipeggers safe? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And actually, unlike the previous government, I've consulted very extensively with, with police chiefs from across the country. And, and I will tell you that we know that there are three ways in which criminals get guns. They are smuggled across the border, they are stolen, or they're criminally diverted. And we are taking action to strengthen gun control laws to prevent those guns from being smuggled into Canada, to prevent them from being stolen from legal gun owners, and to prevent their legal purchase. Bill, uh, Minister, sir. I, I'm sure the Honourable Minister appreciates the coaching he's getting, but I'm sure he can answer all on his own. So I would encourage everyone to listen to what the Honourable Minister has to say. The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, in addition to strengthening gun control laws, we've listened to the police when they said they needed additional resources to do their job. We've committed $347 million to, to law enforcement to enable them to conduct gun and gang investigations and to support the prosecution of people that commit these crimes. We've all... The Honourable Deputy... The Honourable Member for Belle Chasse is Mr. Speaker... Instead of attacking honest citizens, the minister should focus on those that need to be deported because there are 50,000 people who are in Canada illegally and there's just been serious negligence at public safety. The CBSA says that there are 50,000 people in Canada illegally who deserve to be deported. Where are those 50,000 people and what is the minister doing to protect Canadians instead of going after honest, law-abiding citizens. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Just, just to go past a little bit the rhetoric and get to the facts, Mr. Speaker, and in fact, I have nothing but respect for law-abiding uh, firearm owners in Canada, and, and it is our reliance on their adherence and, and upholding of our laws that helps keep us safe. But we know that some of their guns can be stolen, for example, and so we're asking them to adhere to stricter storage requirements. There is nothing in our plan that will interfere or interrupt the legitimate lawful activities of hunters and farmers in this country, and, and we will continue to uphold their, their rights and to treat them fairly. We are also not bringing back a long gun registry. The Honourable Member for Barrie Innisfil. Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders revealed in December that 82% of handguns involved in crimes were smuggled in from the United States. The Minister of Public Safety had previously stated that half of crime guns come from domestic sources. The statistics, when the minister was chief in Toronto and carried a gun, show the same picture as today. A very small percent of firearms are from legal sources, while many crime guns are prohibited and from the United States. Can the minister table the source of his information that has now been proven incorrect? The Honourable Minister. Um, un unfortunately, my friend uh, has some of his facts wrong. When I was the chief of police in Toronto, we had a firearms verification unit that traced the source of all handguns. And during the, my tenure as chief for 10 years there, 70% of the guns, crime guns that we seized, handguns, were sourced, smuggled from the United States. The other 30% were, were stolen or di illegally diverted. The 50% 50, the 50 number actually came from Chief Saunders in his first public statement, but he has since as a result of some investigations they've done into smuggling, come up with another number. I, and, and, I, and I acknowledge, I acknowledge, I acknowledge the facts there, but the reality is, guns are. The honourable member for Dorval, La Chine Lasalle. Mr. Speaker, our government has made great strides when it comes to supporting programs and services for seniors. Can the minister tell this House what our government is doing to ensure that seniors get the support that they need to remain active members of their communities? Thank you. The Honourable Minister for Seniors. I want to thank my colleague from Durval, Lachine uh, LaSalle, uh, for her excellent question. Our seniors have built the Canada that we know and love and that they deserve a secure and dignified retirement. Last week, I was pleased to announce $1.5 million in the New Horizons for Seniors funding in support of community-based projects in Manitoba. In Budget 2019, we boosted New Horizons for Seniors funding by $20 million annually so that we could provide even more support for healthy aging and encourage active participation among seniors. We'll have more news on the New Horizons approvals in the coming weeks. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, just minutes ago, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus an international public health emergency. This is a profound step that has only been taken a handful of times over the last decade and one of the chief reasons for this move is their concern that this virus will spread to countries who are not prepared to deal with it. A serious state of affairs that increases the risk for all nations. Given this global escalation, when will this minister table her full plan for all Canadians to see? Time is wasting, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Mr. Speaker, and we are so fortunate to have Dr. Tam as our Chief Public Health Officer, who is an expert advisor to this very committee. We've been following the World Health Organization recommendations since we noticed the cluster in late December. We'll be closely reviewing the recommendations. I will mention, though, that some of them really do speak to the need to support weaker countries that don't have the same integrated systems that Canada has, and also to prevent the misinformation that's leading to racism and stigmatization for so many uh, Chinese Canadians and other people of Chinese descent around the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Vancouver Island Health Authority recently had to take over administration of three seniors care facilities due to unsafe conditions. Three years ago, this government approved the sale of these facilities to Ang Bang Insurance, which is now a Chinese state-owned corporation. Foreign corporations have no connection to our communities and should not be profiting from poor quality seniors' care. Will the government exclude seniors' care facilities from foreign ownership? Absolutely. The Honourable Minister of the Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, uh, Cedar Tree Investments is bound uh, in this arrangement, Mr. Speaker. It, it, it has been reviewed. It's being reviewed constantly by provincial authorities. They have adhered. They are supposed to adhere to a number of different standards, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the, the, the Minister of Industry, uh, Science and Economic Development is following that case closely. Good, good answer. That's all the questions for today. The Honourable Whip for the Bloc Québécois has a point of order. If I may, Mr. Speaker, when our leader was addressing the government, our members clearly heard the member for Dufferin-Caledon say something.